<laughs> I can edit it. Right, um, yes. So I eat it on breakfast. What I do is I have toast okay. and put cottage cheese on the toast and we cook. Well, so bread and then we cook it in the oven and then I put poached eggs on top. Okay. So what I've done before, that sounds good. I've heated it up and almost used it like queso. Okay. That yeah. That could work as before. well. Yeah, yeah, cottage cheese queso. Oh, and I, well. I actually I do that and I mix it with salsa. No, yeah, no. perfect. See, so, all right, cool. I don't feel like a weirdo. So, <laughs> and, like, I get Rye makes me a cheese sauce, which I get, and I use it as salad dressing now. So it's like cottage cheese and this like, what would call it hot pepper relish and salt and salt, and I use it on as salad dressing. It's fucking awesome. Like this is like the perfect way to enter into the podcast. People are coming in. It's like, yeah, y'all want to hear some unhinged recipes while one of us tries to make sure our dog doesn't make too much licking noise in the background and the other just wanders aimlessly through the house picking up toys that his toddler threw. <laughs> How many Legos have you stopped? I guess he's too young for is he too young for Lego? Yeah, he didn't mess with Legos, but he's got all the hold on, let me turn this camera around. If I can, actually. Mm-hmm. All right, well you're doing that, I'm gonna do like the whole intro thing. Welcome to the OFX podcast. I'm gonna collapse and along with me as always is the full extension Philly, Bethany McChesney. <laughs> and the hybrid raccoon, the victor of Dallas, Dylan Scott, searching for Lego landmines. Yeah, there's all these little link, not Lincoln log thing. Maria, what are these things called? We don't see, we don't even know. No, no. Did, did you buy them for the child or were they bought for the child by someone else? Oh, that's a good question. Who bought these? Okay, nope, Maria got him for the child. Okay, so when I had my kids, I think I went two years before I bought him anything. Oh, because it was just coming from, like, yeah. grandparents? Yeah, like, at one point, we had six ball pits. Six ball yeah, pits? My family think to, seemed to think that the appropriate gift for a starting out family in a small home is a ball pit. Yeah. And many of them. I, I don't question one ball pit. <laughs> I start questioning, well, depending on the number of kids, I do start questioning after two ball pits. At six ball pits, it is pretty excessive. Like well, To be honest, eventually the ball pit turned into two by tens that we just put around because we had enough balls. So we just filled it up and actually made like a, you know, McDonald's-esque yeah. ball pit for the kid. There was no living room left. That's exactly what I was thinking. You just made a, you just made a virus incubator pretty much. <laughs> Yes. All, All right. right. Beth, what was your favorite toy as a kid? I know they didn't let you watch TV, but did it let you have toys? Oh my gosh, I don't remember. I did play with Barbies. There you go. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. I was big on the Transformers. You were Transformers? I like Transformers. I was in a I was an electronics kid, so I was playing with a Game Boy. See, they didn't they didn't have that. Atari. I had Atari 2600. Yeah. Pong. I mean, I hey, I can't help that you were deprived <laughs> as a child, but... I hey, mean, I had the most sought-after toy as a child. I had the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. thing was like seven feet long. That's, that's I was, good. All I had was... All I had was a G.I. Joe. Actually, so I had I had surgery when I was a kid. Um, I was like four years old for a hernia surgery. This is a very funny story. So let's go ahead and just... Let's yeah. go ahead and go the whole, we're going to go the whole yeah. way with it. Yeah. Uh, my, my, this is one of my mom's favorite stories. So, and this ties into GI Joe, because when I went back there to have my surgery, you know, they have to put that mask on you. It's got to put you to sleep and everything. So I had my little GI Joe man with me. So we put the mask on the GI Joe guy first, you know, that kind of, that calmed my soul. Uh-huh. Um, man, this is, this is going to go so full circle. So put the little GI Joe thing and that calmed me. And then I was able to put the mask on. Now the funny part is having the hernia surgery, I had still not learned, you know, how to delineate between body parts. I just knew that that area hurt. <laughs> so my mom, as I wake up, hears me down the hallway as a four-year-old going, oh, my weenie hurts. <laughs> I, wish I'd, I wish I'd never had a hernia. <laughs> and she said she could just hear me yelling down the hallway when I woke up. Um. And so all that's to say is that my mom is my comfort. And before the Dallas race, I was having some anxiety. And so I call her up 
she doesn't even know I'm racing. And she goes, hey, what are you doing? Like, I got a race in about an hour, and I'm doing what every guy does or every kid does when they're scared. I'm calling my mom. Yo, I need to talk for a minute because I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> nice. Oh, Good I hope point. my son does that. <laughs> Did she calm you down? Yeah, it actually really helped. She happened to be with her sister who was down, and, like, I have great memories of her coming down from Michigan, and we would play in the backyard, catch fireflies, and they were like, just – just take your mind off it for a second. Just go to a peaceful place and relax and think about. And then we just, we cracked some jokes and laughed and it did it calm me down. And it was a good phone call to make. Uh, Cause that got me in the right headspace to go back out there and race. Cause I get some pretty bad race anxiety and I don't like it. So, you know, it, it, it brings us to an interesting thought. Like, so, this started out as fun for you, right? Like this, you know, way back when you did your first race in, I think it was Texas back when they had the yep. invitational and you, you ended up winning the the non-invitational part of the pro way. Mm -hmm. It got to the point now where it's gone from fun to, yeah, where it's, 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 it's like a job. It's anxiety. It's, it's, is it still fun? Yeah. Yeah. It's still fun. I think, I don't think you could look at the the videos and pictures and see my face afterwards and stuff, even like, and just see the smiles and everything. And you could just tell that there's a joy for it. Um, I, I still, I've had race anxiety my entire life, you know, e even back to inconsequential track meets when I was just running in high school and middle school, it was always there. Um, and it, it's anxiety about just, you know, two things. One, you know the pain that you're about to go through. Um, and I know the places that I'm willing to push myself. So I'm like, well, this is going to be a really rough experience. Um, it's eased when you win. Like, you feel like shit, but at least you won. It's a lot harder, like in Amsterdam, where you're just getting, I was just getting hammered and having to race through that. Um, but the entire time, like, what I'm most worried about is just underperforming. I'm like, I've put in so much work. I've taken away so much time from other people, from other things. People have sacrificed for me. I'm like, man, if I, I don't want to let myself down with the effort I give. And normally I could walk away from a race and not be upset with that because I try hard regardless of how the performance comes out. But it's just the, I decided that I'm going to leverage time away from people that I'm never going to get back. And I do that constantly with my training and racing and there has to be something to show for it. And so that does sit heavy on you when you line up. So I, th I think it's really good for people to hear. Cause I know like we deal with a lot of people who are new to, to fitness and just doing their first races and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're scared. And yeah. for, for them to hear like, and I think Beth, we've talked about it before too. And I know you've gone through race anxiety and whatnot. And, and for oh, them yeah. to hear that you guys go through that it's i think it's good for everybody like it just it normalizes it yeah for sure i i've said this multiple times and, and i'll continue to say it that like us the, the people who are running the fastest out there we're having 90 percent of the same experience as everybody else you know regardless of if you're finishing in 58 minutes or if you're finishing in an hour and 35 like when you're struggling through a station there's a point where we're struggling through a station when you're out there running and you're like, this is all I got right now. We've all been there. So like it never gets easier. You just go faster. That's all that happens. I'm, I'm going to take one exception to that. And when Tara runs by you and smacks you in the ass, she's not hurting as much as we are. <laughs> no, that, no. Yet. <laughs> yeah, because not every, not every single race is miserable. Like <laughs> I've had races before where like, Oh, it was great. The entire from start to finish. It's a it's a once in a blue moon that it happens that you have a race experience where you're like, I could do anything right now. Um, and those are the best. And, you know, I hope that people who are, you know, new to races continue down that path so they get to experience it. Because there's going to be a time where you go out there and you're just like, just let's move. And I got through the burpees so much easier than I ever have before. And every one kilometer run feels like it's 800 meters. You know, everything's just do, do, do clicking. Um, and that's a cool experience. And, and the more you race, the closer you get to having that opportunity. But yeah, it's, it's pretty normal across the board. All right.
I, I always feel off about it because people ask like, and, and like, I'll be dealing with some of our clients will be like, do you get nervous? Do you get, and then I'm, I'm like, they ask me, do I get anxiety? And I'm like, I understand it. Mm -hmm. I feel if I say I get pre-race anxiety, it's not doing it. I'm almost doing it a disservice because I, 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 I'm just not that guy. Right. So I, I love when you guys can, when they can see that you guys do, and it just, it makes, it makes it better. Anyway, a lot of our clients are oh, yeah. listening to our show, Beth, and, and it's good to hear this. Well, yeah. Like yeah. what, what's your probably, you probably just nervous energy. You know, there's a different, yeah, there's nervous energy and there's race anxiety. Race anxiety is I want to go hide in a corner and I want to go home. Like I want to get on the next flight out of here. Nervous energy is just I'm chomping at the bit. I'm like, my stomach kind of hurts. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's anyway, it's like I said, I think for me to say I understand, I do a disservice to it. So I, I'm glad that you guys can point it out. But you don't got a ton of time. Let's talk about Dallas, man. Yeah, we're not, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. We're not even going to talk about the other racing before. We'll just talk about Dallas. Okay, let's talk about Dallas. All right, Dallas, you're 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 getting ready to go. How you feeling? Um. So, the whole week leading into it, I was I was traveling for work. Um. So I was up and down the East Coast, and then I flew in from Boston the night before. And I'll be honest, I wish I, I didn't quite nail my taper as best I wanted to. And I think that that really showed late in the race um, with the wall ball implosion and <laughs> the boneheaded mistake from eating Nutella and not knowing there's milk in it as a lactose intolerant individual. That really came back to bite me. Um, so I made a couple of mistakes. But overall, like lining up, getting started and out the gate, I was like, okay, the run is here. I could feel that in my legs. I was like, we can run today. I don't know how strong we are today. Um, and that was going to be the question. And then sleds were moving pretty good. My sled pull, we saw the fiasco with that. And Did Rich Ryan inside. sabotage your sled? I had, I saw him over near it yeah, in the race. Yeah. And I was like, this, what's this guy doing? <laughs> um, but... Yeah, so there was that, but honestly, that didn't – it didn't affect the sled pull that bad. Um, and it was just, hey, I got to get this fixed by the time I get down to the other end so that I'm not having this weird hitch where I would pull and then the weights would slide and fall in front, and then the pull would pull them back onto the thing. But the, that means that the initial pull is just like getting the weight back onto it, and then it starts to move. And so that was just a little jankity for like three fourths of the length. But after that, it was clean. Um, through the burpees, I wish I would have felt better there. That's where I started going. Oh, yep, that's the Nutella. Um, <laughs> this is not this is not good right now. Um, and at the rower was about where I started feeling the issue that I thought was coming in the legs, where I was like, yep, yep, here we go. Like and they're that, starting to go out. The rower is usually a strong spot for you too, right? Like that's usually a kind of a comfort zone yeah it was it was good and bad good that it's normally a comfort zone in that even while things were going bad I was still able to match whatever Rich Ryan was pulling so I was like I, I was calculating already how much time I needed because I figured my wall balls were going to take four and a half to 445 I, I had a feeling and I was like I knew in my head that he had done 348 last week and I said if I give myself about a minute 10, I can be okay. Um, I didn't expect him to go 328. He made that a lot closer than I wanted it to be. Um, but so I'm sitting there doing the math, and I'm like, match him here. Try to outrun him a little bit. Your lunges are good, so maybe you can get some more gap there. And I was just doing mental counts of when he would come into a station, when I would come out of a station. Um and I was like, if I get there and I get 35 wall balls in, I don't think he can close it. And I had exactly 35 wall balls when he came in. And I was like, all right, we're going to break at this point and at this point. And I did not plan to break at 94. I went to throw the ball in my shoulder. Like, I, it just stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just see, I just go up and the ball just like stays in my hands and then goes to the ground. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't, I can't throw this right now. And everybody starts screaming. I hear like you hear like a crowd pop. Um, and it's like, pick up the ball. I'm like, listen, guys, if I could pick up the ball, I would. I do understand what needs to be accomplished for me to finish the race. <laughs> Don't worry. 
<laughs> I I know what I need to do. I can't do it yet. So if you'll give me about three seconds, um, and the plan was just to listen to his judge until I heard 91. And then I was like, if I pick it up, I can do six faster and he can do nine and I'll be okay. Um, so that was, you know, that was a painful way to finish. I've when I've won races most of the time, I can just walk across the finish line and I'm okay. That one was like, I need to collapse right now. I'm done for. I'm cooked. Uh, and I felt every bit of that. I made some, definitely made some nutritional mistakes and definitely made uh, a couple of resting mistakes, knowing all the travel that I had to do that week um, and just didn't quite have the legs under me to close the race out. But the good news is, is I can race 80% decent and 20% not well and still go 58 on a pretty rough course. That at least speaks to good fitness. So that was a, a real a goal from going to Dallas was to get some confidence back after Amsterdam to be like, am I still actually good at this? Did did you um did you get to watch it live, Beth? Uh yeah, I did. Yeah. So were you like me when he when he broke at ninety four going? That I think <laughs> you could hear us through the TV. Like we were all like <laughs> Like I had it, I had it streamed off my phone out of the TV, and I'm like, pick it up, God damn it! I know. <laughs> Trust me, I felt everyone in the arena like be like, "What is he doing right now?" And I'm like, "This is not a conscious decision. <laughs> this is a, this is fully physiologically." I, me. I actually thought maybe you were trying to make it like a photo finish, just to add excitement. Uh, you know what? I should have. Uh, you know what? I should have played it that way. I should be like, "Did y'all like what I did there?" Uh, <laughs> or like, <laughs> yeah, or like match him and beat him by like a half a wall ball. I I, I don't know well, how to play with Match and Rich right now. He's uh he's moving pretty good. <laughs> no, no. All I saw was that man just continually going up and down, and I was sitting there going, I got. I told him, I said I got the when I, I broke it fifty three maybe, and I I was convinced that he was going to catch me. Um, I was like, there's no way. Like I'm not going to rip another twenty set, and I got lucky enough to get. A decent set off but I, I told him I said I almost dropped the ball at 53 and turned to you and went you son of a bitch you're gonna get me <laughs> <laughs> I was so close to doing it and but I was like eh, he might not it's not just that he went unbroken but his cadence was so fast super clean like I mean you look at his reps he was like he hit it perfectly of like boop mm-hmm. parallel boop parallel and was just turning the ball over really good and I I was racing the whole time knowing that that was coming. Um, I was like, I think he's just going to come through these wall balls like a freight train. Um, and like, even speaking of speaking of going through something like a freight train, what I don't think anybody will have a video of it, but on my way to the wall balls, I had, I had to run over a volunteer. Um, <laughs> and I had no other choice. Now I'm going to, I'm going to say a few things. When I made the conscious decision that I was going to have to run over the volunteer, I had judged their size and said, this person can take me running into them. Like, <laughs> they were, they were, a, they were a little bigger than me. They were a dude. I was like, this guy can take a hit. He'll be okay. Okay. And, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Because here were my options. My options were barriers and do anything there. My options were a bunch of women and my options were this volunteer going the wrong direction <laughs> who is equally sized, if not bigger than me. And I have to get to the wall balls. So in that case, you just put a shoulder down and apologize <laughs> as you hit them <laughs> and then keep running. Um, so to whoever, who that person was, I'm sorry. Um, I had to do what I had to do. <laughs> I think um, I, I noticed the rock zone times were really, was the rock zone very big or was it very crowded? Cause they were, the rock zone times were pretty significant. So the rock zone time, there's an issue with the skier. So the skier time is not picked up. So the rock zone, so I think my rock zone says like seven forty something. Yeah. So you need to take off what would be a normal skier time from that. So the rock zone in reality was three forty five to four minutes. Um, okay. It wasn't, it was kind of big. The worst part about it, though, was that you would run to an out and have to do a complete 180. So you'd have to run, stop, spin, go. 
And so there was just a lot of pivot turns. Um, and then the course in general was, was pretty crowded. Um, you were doing a lot of weaving to navigate. I, I feel like I got kind of lucky. I was catching a lot of breaks where I wouldn't have to go really wide. Um, and I think maybe three or four times I got unlucky and was like, ah, shit, I'm going to have to go out far outside to get around this. But for the most part, um, I was able to navigate it pretty well. But that could be, you know, that right there could be a race. That could make six seconds. That was the difference, six seconds. You know, whether or not you got caught where you had a line of people across and you were like, I can't get through this. And that happens five, six times. That takes one second each time. There's your race. Um, and I was talking with some people afterwards and even some people in the comments and saying, like, it does make for a tough race experience for the general people who are out there racing when they're getting run up on by folks um, who are because we're out there trying to race as fast as we can. We're trying to win. We're in a competitive mode and they're doing the same thing, but they're racing more of the event. I'm completing a high rocks and it sucks to be out there like, hey, I'm running doubles with my friend. And then all of a sudden you just have this dude come and, you know, bull rush you from behind. It's like pushing you out of the way and yelling. It, that's not very enjoyable. So it's just, it's a little rough when you have such overlapping ability levels out there on the course at the same time um, to not make it sort of a, a bad experience for both ends. So what, what would you suggest as a solution to that? You're either going to have to increase the venue size to where you can just have more room for people to run and then really, really strictly enforce having a fast and a slow lane area because at the start of the race, they did have somebody literally run in front of us with a whistle and like to notify people. They did that for the first one kilometer just on the whistle, moving people. And that helped. Um, but you're either going to have to increase the venue size to where these folks can run to the far outside. And it might increase the one kilometer time. If you're going to continue to have, you know, women's doubles, open out there at the same time as you're going to have like elite level men mm -hmm. yeah that, that's um, my suggestion is they need to reorganize the wave times yeah yeah i mean you've got to do something on that um yes, because again it's just it, it makes for a poor experience for those people like i get it i'm out there to race for myself but like i i think about hey this sport is an event and you're supposed to enjoy it it's supposed to be fun and it does kind of suck when you get 50 guys coming down the barrel at you and you're like i'm running a 9 30 mile and these guys are coming at me at 5 30 and i'm trying to get out of the way but they're coming left and right and it's just you know that's not not fun yeah yeah like it, it, sorry go ahead Beth. Oh, no, I was just, I'm going to share just the messages that I got about it for the the elite women. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Oh, they yeah, got so, yeah, so I I did get some messages, actually, um, because I had talked on the podcast about how bad Toronto was of an experience, especially on the second day. And um, so, and some people then that raced both, they said that it was for the elite women anyways. It wasn't as bad when you guys went. Um, it was way worse way worse for the elite women and again it did create a pretty um uncomfortable situation for them too so and I mean I I'll just some parts of it and again they don't need to be named um and they would mm -hmm. prefer not to be but just because they're not they're not whining and again the goal of this is to try to figure out how we can make this better because you know these people are they're racing for podiums and fast times and you're creating a really difficult experience so yeah it was that um like constantly having to yell and dodge the whole time they this other part of it too was that in the rock zone the water station was so crowded and people were hanging out at it so you couldn't even get there it was three people deep and it was the whole width of the rock zone um so you couldn't get there and then um there was a funnel system i guess for the spectator crossing and sometimes they would send them along the inside so then you're kind of trapped to like a single lane and everyone funnels in um, so that sounded like a bit of a nightmare, but anyways, this one, um, uh, individual just said it was, it was like a complete, complete gong show on the women's elite side. So, and I mean that a hundred percent 
affects times and your mental state. And I mean, I know what it was like when people, you know, you're just trying to get people to move and you're just saying on your left and then people are getting really, really mad at you too. And I understand the frustrations on both sides, you know, they're trying to do their best too, but I don't think that that fast lane is respected at all though, for some people who just, they're like, well, it's space and I, and I'm running my race and they're kind of, they are a little bit selfish about it too. And, um, but yeah, this, it's something that I feel like if they don't get this sorted and it's, it's kind of like what we saw with Spartan when the elites start getting really frustrated and having really bad experiences, their voices are heard. And if they're starting to complain about something, other people also can be affected by it too. And um, because those are the people that we look up to and, you know, if they're talking and they're complaining about something, it could have a ripple effect on, you know, the general masses coming too. So I think right now, this is one of the biggest issues that High Rocks needs to figure out if they're going to keep filling these venues with 6,000 people, like we can't have all these people leaving super frustrated with their experience. And I believe this was the largest one day North American event to date. And so they, yeah. for one day they had somewhere like 4,000, 5,000 people. Uh, it's supposed to be 6,500. Yeah. But generally, you know, it's a little bit off. So like, you know, even if it's 55 or something like that, either way to me, anything over 3,000 seems to be, where it gets too too crowded on a one day event, it just goes nuts. Unless they, and like I said, unless they reorder the waves, if they take the waves and like put out men's doubles first, then like like men's pro doubles, and then the men's pro, and then slowly go faster to slower, it'll it'll help because you'll have less less passing essentially. And if you take the waves too, I think like I heard some of the wave sizes were like sixty people in a wave. I'm like that's massive. Um. That seems about right. When I think about the the first men's pro wave, like how many guys were standing in that tunnel? It's probably a little bit less than that on our end. It's probably forty. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that in some of the open waves, it was bigger than that. And and yeah, Bethany, for sure, you could see it in the women's race. Um, like I spoke to Amy afterwards, and she told me she said it got to a point where I stopped trying to pass people late. I just jogged with the group because it was so much more energy to weave mm -hmm. in and out and try to push people. That she was like, I'm just going to recover while I run because I'm going to get stuck in a pack. Um, and yeah, that venue was just too small to accommodate what they were trying to do. Um, and I think, of course, like if you talk about a lot of the reason that there were so many people there was it, a lot that that entire event got a huge boost from Nick Bear. Oh, you know, yeah. From from him being there, and he there were so many BPN hats and so many people there to cheer him on and everything, um, which was good good for the sport to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, it put a lot of eyes on it. I think that a lot of people gained some respect for the level of athletes that that we are at the top of the sport because there was a lot of talk and a lot of expectation, not from himself because Nick has been nothing but a super humble guy, and like all he's done is work hard. This is the plan. Here's how I'm going to try to do it. Every conversation that I've had with him, like DMing back and forth, he's only wanted to learn stuff about the sport, nothing but respect for the guy. But there was a lot of people who looked up to him and were like, he's about to come in and crush you guys. Um, he's going to come in and run so fast. Like he's just super big and strong. It can run really well. And I mean, just like the Michael Jordan meme, I, and I took that personally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I felt about it. I was like, I was like, I've been doing this for years, and I know that I'm not an intimidating looking specimen, but you guys are talking about a craft that we've been working on for a hot minute, and I know he's a good athlete, but he ain't about to come in here and just cook us. Um, so there was a part of me that was like, we have to win this and I want it to be a statement win, not like a, like I didn't want it to be close. Um, and it had nothing to do with wanting to beat him as a person. Uh, it had everything to do with being like, cause I, I talked with Rich and Kent beforehand. I was like, guys, we got to defend the turf, like under armor. We must protect this house kind of deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because if we just let other sports and other influencers walk in and they just kick you around, then it's like, well, I guess we are a bunch of frauds, you know? Well, for the record, Bethany thought Nick Bear was going to kill it and um, and crush everybody. I said well, that. I did not say crush. 
<laughs> <laughs> Look, you've made Dylan hide. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't mean. Did. I agree. I I pinned him to go somewhere between fifty nine forty five and sixty one thirty was the range I gave. What did what did I put um, in mind? I put sixty one thirty. Sixty one thirty. Sixty one thirty was. I get. I said pick over under. I gave her sixty one thirty, and she could take the over under. I don't yeah, I mean, I I think you put him on a better course, and he's close to sixty two something. Like that was a rough course, to be honest. Um, and and I think he's going to go back, and he's going to race again in March, and like. The dudes, the uh, he's going to commit to it, um, and I love it. He he so, he did something that I don't think I've ever seen anybody else do in High Rocks. He died, and then resurrected himself. Like yeah, his burpees, he fell to pieces, and he came back pretty darn strong. We 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 were watching, and at the burpees, we're like, okay, well, you know, it's hit him. You know, he's he's done. And then watch waiting in the rowing. We're watching you guys row, and at some point, people in the chat are like. I think Nick Bear quit and all that stuff because he was that far back. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's side by side with Jack D doing wall balls. And, we're, and we honestly wrote, I, and I think I might have been the first one to put, um, did he miss a lap? Like, and I went back and looked at the times. I'm like, no, he just, he he literally resurrected himself and came back and did like a, sm, a what, like a three minute lunge and then a four minute yeah. last K and just came back from the dead. And like, yeah, I mean, the, the dude's tough. Yeah. Like you can't look at all his accolades and things that he's accomplished and everything and be like, oh, he's a pushover. Like it was tough, and and so I'm not surprised that he might have cracked at one point and then found the mental resilience to be like, all right, I'm gonna hammer this back home. So nothing but respect for the dude. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome, and and from all everybody has said, great guy. Yep, a hundred percent. And I'd love to get to go down to Austin and train with him at some point. Like. Um, I think when good people like that come into the sport and bring eyes to it, it's great for the sport. Um, and so I'm all for it. Well, and like you said, the way he did it, he did it with respect. And he came into it and he didn't just like, I'm going to show up and my training's awesome and I'm going to smash everybody. He talked to you. He hung out with Rich and Ron, with Rich and Kent and, and got information. He researched. He didn't just say, I know what I'm doing. I'm awesome. He's like, this is going to be hard. I'm going to learn all I can and I'm going to give it a shot. And it was. Yep. Did he have e-bikes on the course? <laughs> not he did not hey e-bike e-bike was there e-bike was there i talked with e-bike for a second afterwards oh. <laughs> yeah i did i did see old maddie Choi. i think they were second in the uh in the men's pro doubles i think him and somebody else were second in the men's pro doubles and i just want to point out that the Friesen method athlete jesse biddle the former major league pitcher that i coach him and maceo munez doubles pro champions there so. you go <laughs> So just want to say Some, somebody knows right how to there. program. Somebody knows how to get somebody fit, which he's done most of it. I've just given him some specific workouts that have brought him along. But uh but yeah, overall Dallas was a great event from a vibes and atmosphere standpoint. We need to do a couple of things to make it a better event for overall performances for people and experiences on the course. If Irox takes the proper feedback and does that then i think it'll be good um because we don't really criticize just to criticize we criticize with a purpose yeah i mean we we've been doing that for a long time and and in the past high rocks has been very open to to some criticism and and to to making changes so hopefully that continues um somebody else who uh to much less fanfare this time uh, christy o'connell i believe didn't she win the mixed doubles with her partner Mixed doubles. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she won mixed doubles with her partner. It's actually funny. So I'm walking through the Dallas airport and I'm going one way down this long, long stretch. And I see a guy coming the other way and I recognize him from Instagram and I've stole some of their workouts and it's her husband. <laughs> and so I'm like, I just flag him. I'm like, wait, I know you. And we just start talking and talk for a couple of minutes. I start asking kind of about what her intentions are with the sport and everything. If she wants to really make a run at it, stuff like that. And pretty much it seems like she's at a point from from what he told me that she just wants to enjoy training, yeah. do fun things. She's been locked in on CrossFit for so long that it's like I don't want to find another sport that I have to bury myself into. So I think we'll see her race to whatever her desires are and not so much to whatever the demands are of being top level at the sport. It would be cool to see because that time they had that they got there and obviously they'll get a world's qual time. Um, last year, Worlds would have been a competitive time. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think it would have podiumed. I think if you want to be really competitive, you have to be sub 55, I think. But um, but it would have been good. Like, I mean, they would have been in the mix. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see if if that's the route that she wants to go. But I I think at this point, like, she'll probably show up to events that are local, race to whatever makes her happy. And I mean, we had a couple CrossFitters come out. She raced, Rebecca Fuselay raced, um, and I'm trying to think if there's anybody. Oh, I think I didn't look and see, but Jason Khalifa, I think he did doubles uh, as well. I didn't see how that that went down, but um, again. The more big names that come over and do the sport, um, and the more that they talk about their experience with it and everything, it's just it's good for the sport overall. Um, but that said, don't come disrespecting the people who are decent at it and be like, "We're just gonna walk over you" because well, that ain't happening. How many how many messages at comments did I look at and see when Tia said she's gonna come out and try one? And everybody's saying, oh, she's going to obliterate everybody and all this and that and that. I went through, did some math, and I put Tia at a 62-30. Mm. I don't disagree with that. I think you're pretty darn close. I think she's – I could give her – I could give her anywhere from a 61 to a 63. I could put in that entire range. And it, it could depend on course conditions and stuff yeah, like oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Um. I think that she's one of the CrossFit athletes that could come over and do really well. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think, think that, also, is, that is really well. That's great. Oh, this is awesome. I think she could do well. Another one's Haley Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she could do really well. So I got Emily Rolf up there as one that I thought. I yep. Got. That was, that was going to be my next one that I was going to throw out there. Emily Rolf could do really well. Um, and so I don't have like hate or disrespect for people coming over and giving it a go. Like there are a lot of them. Um, I would love to see Brent Pukowski do one, actually. Uh, Dude, that you would might be... know that he's retired from CrossFit. Yeah, no. I, I ought to, he probably will not, not see it, but I ought to badger him in the DMs and be like, Brent! <laughs> <laughs> Brent, I want your maple syrup ass to come run. Go do high rocks. <laughs> They're like, who's this little, who's this weird guy bothering me? I'm like, don't worry about it. I want to smoke. <laughs> yeah. You want to smoke, Brent? Let's go. Um, <laughs> I'd be all for seeing him come out and race because that'd be a that'd be cool as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my takeaways from Dallas. That's awesome, man. That's great, and and I'm glad it was a good run. And um, we're 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 really excited to see it get another win and have a bounce back performance. Um, Vegas is next. Vegas will be the next High Rocks. You'll see me in about two and a half weeks down in uh in Florida racing some deck of stuff. I'll make sure that I stand up straight on my lunges the best I can. Um, just all the way. Dude, I'll, I'll stand. I'll stand up tall. I heard, <laughs> I heard somebody in the in one of the live streams go like, "This guy's like six foot four. I am not that tall, so I will not <laughs> be standing six foot. I will not be standing six foot four, but I'll stand as tall as six one, six two. Uh, I'm pretty close to six two with no yeah. shoes on. You know what? If I have those endorphin pro fours on, that stack height might get me close. And you might be six six then. Yeah, yeah, I look like I might have looked. I think my legs and my gangliness makes me look taller than I am. So yeah, but yeah, I guess we'll go through it. Um, so you're ready. You're coming up for Deca. You're all set to go. Get that fit. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go race the fit and then come back home and chill with the dog. Oh, um, race the fit, come back home, and then the next thing I'll do will be the Vegas High Rocks. I'll race the hopefully. I mean. As long as I stay healthy and nothing happens, I plan to race the elite race. And then uh, Sunday, I'll race mixed doubles with – I'm not mixed doubles. I'll race uh, pro doubles with my boss. Um, I'm going to make Cameron come out and do one. So that'll be fun. We'll see how fit he is. He's about to do like a three-week trip to Antarctica. So Sounds like a lovely vacation. Yeah, dude, this guy's this guy's a maniac. Like, I don't want to – I'm not going to derail this podcast off to that. But let me tell you. My boss is one of the craziest people I know and has one of the biggest pain caves like that somebody could go into. Like the, the dude's an animal. I mean, I get a paper cut him out for a week. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He Mild. might get it. He might get it. <laughs> he might give himself a paper cut just to feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to completely quit from mild discomfort. It's like the cushion isn't uh -huh. quite right on the couch. I'm out. That's it. I'm done. Well, that's how I am about like Antarctica. He's like, I'm going like this would be a cool trip. I'd be like, the fuck it wouldn't. 
<laughs> no, wait, was sleeping in a tent on the side of a mountain somewhere. You go do that. He's like, oh, it's great. I'm like, that sounds awful. You got a hotel? Like, I'd love a nice hotel. Is there a hot tub? Like, get out of here. Awesome. Man. All right. With All right, that, well, yeah, you're on a, on a timetable, so we're going to let you go. Um, thank you so much, Dylan, and congrats again. And we will be personally seeing you in three weeks. Yeah, I'll see you guys in three weeks. It's very great to talk with you. Thanks for having me on. All right. Congrats, buddy. All right. Bye, y'all. All right. So we had to let Dylan go, but, and we mentioned it, so we'll go through it. We got a few Decker rule changes. So come on, hit me with it. Give me shit. Let's go. So the biggest one I think that people <laughs> <laughs> are maybe putting beef out of is the lunges. So you have to be more upright. Yeah. You yeah. Have to forward. So the rules before your feet had to meet in front of the line. Um, but then the people were getting a super forward bend to them. Yes. Yeah. And what it was, it was kind of making this like disturbing trend of being completely bent over and almost not even lunging anymore. It was like this, your hips were way back. And it was like an extending of the legs back and forth. Kind of like a skiing, cross country skiing. Yeah, thing. kind of. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, so optically it looked, it looked off, but more concerning was, getting new people coming in and trying to lunge like that and putting all that weight in the front and not, you know, it just, it seemed like an accident waiting to happen, like mm -hmm. a, an injury waiting to happen. Somebody, somebody asked me, earlier, like, has anyone gotten injured doing that? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's really gotten seriously injured doing it, but you know, it just because I haven't got hit by a car yet doesn't mean I'm going to keep running across the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it, it was bound to happen. So that that instituted the change, the reason for the change, and then and also the reason for the doing it now, because now is not the ideal timing, not at all, and, and I'm not going to pretend like it is. Um, in the fact that it is going to be in place for worlds, um, would have really rather waited till the beginning of next season, but how shit would we have felt if somebody did end up getting hurt? Because yeah. we didn't change it, right? And yeah. and how bad would that be to look to say, oh, you could have changed this. You knew it was a problem and you didn't. So that's why the change right away. Yeah. Um, what else? So some other things was the you cannot have two hands on the box. You can have one. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, not a lot of us do that. But um, I think in some of the age group races, that might be a little bit more of a thing. Yes, and some of the yes, yeah, some of the age groups were getting to the point with that two-handed thing where it was getting lightning fast and becoming like a cheat code. Like oh, they, oh, like they were that was their plan on purpose. Yeah, oh, I thought yeah. it was more like incidental. Yeah, well, it got to the point where people were were doing some some like originally the whole intent behind the rule of the incidental hand contact and all that was to help people who you know were struggling and couldn't you know, do yeah. the, the way we do, we do them without the hands and just so that they could get over, so they could finish, so they could get through. And mm -hmm. then people were finding a way to like, Hey, this is, I can go with, and not the elites, none of the elites. Right. But a lot, some of the age groups were like, you know, I can speed things up and do this. So this was just an effort to curtail that and make it less of an appealing option. Um, okay. And that does not take place in the worlds because people qualified the way they qualified. Yeah. So this is the only change for worlds is the lunges. This is just for 2025. Okay, so then, well, it said chalk will be allowed. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> straight out honesty, I think that 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 was put in there for Atlas. So there's not going to be like chalk buckets here at the Farmers Carry at Worlds. There will be no chalk buckets at Worlds in the Farmers Carry. No, no, there will not. Um, and I think, uh, Yancey has left it up to the individual gyms if they want to use chalk. And I don't imagine most will. Um, well, at this point, we're kind of used to not using chalk, but I do find yeah. when we're doing an event somewhere for the first time, uh, people put chalk on their hands. Cause if they're, you know, if it's that style of gym. Yeah. 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 Like a lot of CrossFit gyms, right. They got it all over the place. Yeah. Like the one that we hosted at hybrid, which is a CrossFit gym, the CrossFitters came over all chalked up. <laughs> like You gotta go wash your hands. <laughs> and, and, and that could be part of the deal too, too with, uh, I wasn't big on the chalk rule. So I'm um, like, as, as far as involved in making the chalk rule. So that might be part of the process is that there's a lot more CrossFit gyms 
becoming deca gyms and it's kind of like um they just wear it kind of just fighting in the uphill battle there yeah <laughs> but no i don't i don't uh, don't expect to see a bucket of chocolate worlds and and worlds is still under the 2024 rules which means there was no chalk for that so so no chalk at worlds there'll be no chalk at worlds, no no and the other one was the tank settings it was a big one right so when you are in a mixed pair or even um let's say uh different ages uh, you will both use the highest tank setting up setting applicable to your team. So yeah, the magnetic mm -hmm. magnetic resistance sled will be put on the highest setting of your team. Oh, so if an adult youth team goes, the youth has to move the adult weight. Oh. That's right. And then vice versa. Let's say uh, I teamed up with, uh, with a guy who was 75. We got to use the, the, the men's setting. And again, the reasoning behind this one is, quite frankly, people were dropping it too far. Dropping it too far. Acc yeah. And then we're going to say accidentally. Well, <laughs> and the new tanks with eight settings, I completely understand. Well, so easy to, to like, because from yeah. eight to seven, it's so easy to go to, and, and it's very smaller increments. It's really yeah. easy to to do that. Like, uh, yeah. 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 And and I can't tell you how many times even on the torque tank, where in order to make sure I'm on the correct setting for the woman, I have to jam it all the way up to the men's and then pull it down one. Yeah, that's how just, I do it. Just yeah. to make sure that I'm there because it's very easy to drop down that extra one. So, yeah, I, it was just, it's just a, to maintain that level playing field. And so, yeah. So, but at Worlds, because it is still 2024 rules, you will be able to switch like you did normally. Because that's the way teams qualified. That was the strategies they used. So that stays the same. The only reason the lunges are in there is because it is a safety thing. Otherwise, they would be the same too. And then what else did we have there? I think those were the the big ones. The lunges, the oh, the box with one hand, and then the uh, the resistance tanks, resistance sleds. I think that was it. Yeah. No, oh yeah, and a little thing we did notice, and this was just cleaned up in the wording. This is not a change rule; it's just wasn't worded stringently enough to enforce it. Um, when you're pulling the magnet resistance sled, you use the handle, not midway up on the straps. Yeah. Right. So yeah. It was worded a little vague last time, so we cleaned the wording up. Yeah. Um. Yes, that's. Yeah. So straight up to criticism. Straight up to criticisms of the timing um, being so soon to Worlds. You're, you're absolutely right. It sucks. It's not the ideal timing. It's not when we wanted to do it. Um, but just because it is safety, it, we couldn't put it off. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it just became more evident through the beginning of this 2025. I know it's 2024, but 2025 season. Yeah. It just became more and more evident how bad it was getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then if anyone out there has a question, has a complaint, Message me. I don't care. I'm open. Mm -hmm. you know, bring them on. <laughs> yes. So yeah. Um, I think that's it. That's it. I think that's all we need. Do you have anything else you wanted to go through? Um, no, I don't think so. All right. All right. all right. Let's call it a day. Beth, take us home. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And again, thanks, Dylan, for being on today and telling us about his Dallas race. And um, yes, uh, we're two and a half weeks now till DECA World. So we're gearing up for that, getting excited. So thanks for listening. Um, and yeah, take care. Take care.